Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here is with you, and we are glad that you're with us again this uh, fine Sunday afternoon. We hope that you're ready for our study from God's Word. We're going to be building a house today, and I uh, hope that you will stick around for that. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of YouTube uh, videos on how to do things uh, you can find on the, on the internet, and... Uh, Pretty much anything you want to do, you can probably find a YouTube video on how to do it. Uh, I was talking to a fellow the other day, and he said um, people were asking him how to do things. He seemed to know how to do everything, and he said, "Look," he said, "just just go to YouTube, just get on the internet, and you know, type in what you want to do, and you can find someone has a video or some kind of explanation on how to do things." You know. Um, uh, DIY sort of thing. Do it yourself. I mean, you want to build a building, there's a there's a video for it. You want to make a cake, there's a video for it. You want to learn how to do whatever. Build a greenhouse or uh, make a gun. I, I don't know, just whatever. You want to work on your car, how to fix your car, there's a video for it. So, a lot of, lot of ways to do things, but today we're going to be talking about uh, building a house. And uh, we're going to look at a, a an important fact or important feature important feature of, of building a house. How do you know when you've got it right? How do you know when it is the way it should be? And so we're going to be talking about looking at the right pattern. And we're talking about the pattern for the church. Now I'm not saying we're going to be building a church. We're not building a building, but we're trying to find if the church that you read about in the New Testament, can it be found, and how do you know when you found it? And the way to do that is, of course, go to the pattern, go to the blueprint, go to the book that tells you how it was built. And if you find, if you find a church that was built after that pattern, then you know you found the New Testament church. And I can assure you, friends, you can find it. It can be found. It just might take you a little digging. And so we're going to be looking at some things that are very important on how to how to know if you found the the New Testament church. First of all, I want to give you our contact information if you want to if you want to call me on the program. Uh, the phone number is area code three three six four two seven nine six nine six. That's area code three three six four two seven nine six nine six, or six two seven nine five six three six two seven nine five six three six two seven W L O E. Uh, 427-WMYN or 627-WLOE. You can reach me at 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is my email address. A word from the Lord at gmail.com or 276-340-2653. 276-340-2653. Now, how do, how do we know we found the, the New Testament church? Well, you know, when you're looking at a house, let's just take this for example. When you're looking at a house, maybe you maybe you built a house. Maybe you are, are planning on building a house, and you've got the blueprint. You've got so many square feet. You know, it's going to be 1,800 square feet, and it's going to have a big den and living room and a game room, and there's going to be a garage or a carport built onto it, and and you've got you know three bedrooms and two baths and a big kitchen and you've got everything laid out. Well, the blueprint is is all the details. The blueprint has all the details that you need to, uh, uh, to know how to build that house. And the blueprint is very, very specific. I mean, doors have to be in a certain spot. Uh, bathrooms are in certain spots. You know, uh, the, the wiring has to be a certain way. And so a blueprint is very, very detailed. And if you walk into a house, you have let's say you have the blueprint, and you walk into a house, and you, re you realize that, you know what, there are some rooms that just don't match the blueprint. You know that that house was not built using the blueprint that you have in your hand. I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, if you walk into a house, and it's got two bedrooms, and the blueprint says there's three, you know this is not the same blueprint. This is not the, the right plans for this house. If there's, um, if there's uh, three bathrooms in this house, three full baths in this house that you're in, and the blueprint only calls for two, 
or one and a half baths, you know somebody didn't follow. This is not the blueprint. This is not the, the layout of this house. And so if the house does not look like the pattern, then it's not the correct house. And that's the same thing that's true with the Lord's church, the New Testament church, the church you read about in the Bible, the church of Christ, the only church you can find in the Bible. It has to follow a blueprint. So if you're going to find it, you have to follow the blueprint, and then you can know that, well, this indeed is the church you read about in the Bible. It has a certain pattern that, that has to be followed. And friends, it's just, it's just that simple. And we're going to show you, as we go through this lesson, we're going to show you how God has always been very specific about things that are going to belong in the church, things that belong in the New Testament church, things that... Um, how, how things should be, down to the last detail. And so that's why it's so important that we go to the Bible. Now, some people say, well, you know, James, you folks in the Church of Christ, y'all just, just harp on the Bible all the time. Well, that's because we know the Bible is the pattern. The Bible is the blueprint that we should follow, and it's going to tell us if the church that we're in is right. If we're doing things by the pattern, then we know that God is going to be pleased with it. Just like if... If you were building a house, uh, you wouldn't want the builder to take liberties uh, with the blueprint. You know, he, you wouldn't want him to say, well, here's the blueprint, but here's what I'm going to do differently. No, it, you know, this is the house that we wanted. This is how, how it's going to be built. This is, this is uh, important that we follow all these details. Well, God is no different. I mean, why would we think that God would, uh, uh, would mind if we changed the house that his son is going to build, and yet we wouldn't do the same thing if someone came along and said, well, we're going to change the house that you want to build. <clears throat> so, so it's very important. Now, friends, notice this. You know, the Bible, the things written for time were written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. And as we look at the Old Testament and we see how God did things in the Old Testament, then it helps us to realize God will do very similar things in the New Testament. And friends, God always had a pattern. He always insisted that people follow a pattern when they were doing things for him. Now, for example, the ark. Noah built the ark after a pattern. Uh, God didn't tell Noah, build an ark and just, you know, you just do, do it your way, however you think's best, just, just build me an ark. Now, if God had said, just build a boat and didn't give uh, Noah any specifics, then whatever Noah came up with, that would that would have to be okay. God would say, would have to say, well, I just told you to build a boat. But instead, God gave details on how to on on how to build or what to build, and uh, Noah had to follow that pattern. And that's why I'm saying to you that this is uh, this this is the important thing that we're learning from when God tells people to do something. God gives them a pattern uh, to follow. Now, I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 6, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, here's what the Bible says. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for all the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Now, right off the bat, God specified the kind of wood he wanted Noah to use. So Noah couldn't use any other kind of wood. He had to use this, uh, the specific kind of gopher wood. And he says, pitch it within and without. So, in other words, it's going to have to be uh, coated or pitched on the inside and outside. If Noah said, well, you know what? Uh, you know, that pitch is kind of, kind of expensive. Uh, and as a contractor... I know I can cut corners here, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pitch the boat on the outside. I mean, you know, everybody's going to see the outside. Water's going to be on the outside. We're just, we'll just make sure we pitch it uh, on the outside but not on the inside. Well, that's, you know, you, you can't do that. You're cutting corners. You don't get to cut corners with God's pattern. Verse 15, and then God says, And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. This is the fashion which thou shalt make it. So here's the pattern. Here's how you do it. Here are the dimensions. Here are the things that are going to be put in it. And here's how big they are, how long they are, how wide they are. 
The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. So God specified how tall, how deep, how wide the ark was going to be. And then he says in verse 16, A window shalt thou make to thee in the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish up it above. So you've got a window that's a certain height, and there's only one, only one window in, the, in this ark. Now, Noah could have said, you know, I, I, I think we didn't need two windows, or three. No, Noah built it according to the fashion. Um, then he says, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. Now, what if Noah said, you know what, I'm going to put a front door and a back door on. Well, that would be following the pattern. And God says, <clears throat> the lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. So you've got three stories. Now, what if Noah said, you know what, I think I can get a little more space in here. I'm going to put four in here. If I make it just a little bit taller, I can get four stories in here, four floors. Carry more people, carry more animals, carry more food, whatever we're going to be in there. We're going to be in here a while. Uh, let's, let's just see how much we need. No, Noah, make it according to the fashion. And here's what the Bible says in verse 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah did all that God commanded him, according to all that God commanded him. So Noah followed the pattern. He followed the pattern of the ark. He didn't deviate from it. Now, friends, that, that should tell us, just that principle alone ought to tell us that when God gives a pattern, he says, here's the pattern of things, this is what, what we're to follow. Now, he did the same thing with Moses. Now, Moses was going to build a tabernacle. Now, a tabernacle was just a tent, basically, that was going to, be, that was going to house the ark of the covenant. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exodus 25 verse 9. Notice this. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. So here's Moses. Moses is up in the mount. He's getting instruction from God and God says uh, build a tabernacle and here's the pattern. Here's the pattern. Here's the blueprint. That you're, going, that you're going to follow. Now, friends, who is going to deviate from that? Who's going to be so bold as to say, well, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to make this my own. I'm going to tweak it my own. I'm going to uh, make things my own way. And then uh, God's still going to be happy with that. No. God said, I'm giving you a model. That's what the word means. It means a model. A, a resemblance. I'm giving you a figure. I'm giving you a blueprint here, and this is how you make it. Now, friends, you don't get to deviate from that. Um, have you ever seen these um, the, the the models of cars that they use when they're making a new uh, a new models coming out, and they have the engineers, you know, they have these big old chunks of clay, and they carve them, and they smooth them, and they, you know, they put all the lines and the curves and the contours in it, and and it's a scale model of, of this car, of what the car's going to be like. That's, you know, once they get that right, that's what the car's going to be like. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine a, a, a car maker, you know, some real nice fancy car, Lamborghini or something, and they've, they've got a new car scaled out, drawn out, molded out, fashioned and formed everything that's going to be in it, you know, down from the the wheels to the leather seats, I mean, it's, it's all going to be the best of the best, whatever. And then some guy comes along and says, well, you know what, I think that what we're going to do with this is we're going to put some big uh, buckshot gumbo mudders on it. I think that, you know, big mud tires, that's what it needs. No, you don't get to change that. You, you don't get to change anything about this. This is the way it's going to be. This is the way it's going to be. Uh, modeled and molded and fashioned. This is the pattern. And someone comes up and says, well, you know what, I don't really like the uh, the way the, I don't really like that engine in there. We'll, we'll take out this big powerful engine that uses too much fuel and we're going to put a little engine in it that came out of an old Yugo or something. No! You don't get to change the inside or the outside. This is the way the manufacturer wants it. Well, friends, 
that's the way that's the way God looked at the tabernacle and that is how Moses looked at it when he's going to build it. I'm going to build it to follow the pattern. In Exodus 26 Exodus 26 and verse 1 notice this is what God says moreover thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them the length of one curtain shall be eight and twenty cubits, and the breadth of one curtain uh, four cubits, and every one of the curtains shall have one measure. Now, what if, what if Moses said, you know, God wants blue and purple and scarlet, but I kind of like yellow. And, and let's say Miriam comes up and says, you know, um, you know I, I'm a pretty good interior decorator here, uh, blue and purple and scarlet, those are kind of all the same uh, kind of hues. You know, they're kind of dark, and we need something to live it up. We need some pinks, or we need some pastel colors. Uh, yellows might be might be good, but how about some, uh, oh, I don't know, how about some oranges? Bright orange, neon greens. Let's Let's make those colors. Let's put those in there. No, you don't get to dictate the color of the curtains. You don't get to, to choose the size of the curtains. You don't get to choose the number of curtains. This is all part of the pattern. And my point, friends, is this. God was very specific about, the, about this tabernacle. Now, when Stephen is telling uh, the Jews in Acts 7 how Moses operated, how Moses followed God, he said, our fathers, this is Acts uh, 7 verse 44, he said, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Moses didn't get to add stuff of his own to this tabernacle. He didn't get to change it in any way, shape, or form. The pattern for the tabernacle was to be followed as God had instructed. And it wasn't just the tabernacle itself, friends. It was all the things in the tabernacle. I'm talking about down to the last detail. Friends, take your time sometimes and just read through the book of Exodus. Um, Exodus 25. Well, I'm, you know what? We're going to read some of this. But Exodus 25, you're going to see a lot of things, a lot of details that God specified that it's going to go in the tabernacle, not just the tabernacle itself, not just the number of curtains and, and things like that, what they're made of, but the things that are inside the tabernacle. For example, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25, in Exodus 25 and verse 10. Listen to what God says. And thou shalt make an ark of shittim wood, Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about, and shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be on the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. So here's how you're going to carry it. You're going to run these. You're going to run these these staves through these rings, these specified gold rings, one on each corner, and that's how they're going to carry the ark because, you know, the priests weren't supposed to touch the ark. So this is how they're going to carry it. Uh, the stave shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee, and thou shalt make a, a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims, or two two angels of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and one cherub on one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even 
Of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof, and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces shall look one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. So they're going to be facing each other. All these very specific details. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark shalt thou put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in the commandment unto the children of Israel. All right, so now this is just some details about the ark of the covenant. And even the the poles that were used in carrying the ark. Now, now, friends, listen. God put a lot of time and effort in giving specifics about the tabernacle and the things in the tabernacle. Do you think that it's important? I mean, even down to the candlestick. Let's come on down. And look at verse thirty-one. We're in Exodus twenty-five, verse thirty-one. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls and his knops, and his flower shall be the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knob and a flower, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knobs and their flowers. And there shall be a knob under the two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. I mean, I'm talking about, friends, this is very detailed. Very, very detailed um uh, specifics about 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 a candlestick. Now, listen. How many times do people say, "Well, you know, a lie to lie. Just put a candle in there, and it'll work, right? Just put a kerosene lamp in there, and it'll work. Just put an oil lamp in there, it'll work. Get off some light." Well, God wants specifics. God wants specifics about the about the candlestick, how it's going to be made, where it's going to be, and uh, what it's going to look like. And so, this is this is how it's going to be used, how, or how it's going to be made. And, and so my point, friends, is, is again, God was very specific about the tabernacle. Now, why do you think that he was so specific about the tabernacle? Why do you think that he spent so much time talking about these things that are going to be in the tabernacle? Because he's painting a picture. He's painting a picture for things to come. Remember, the Old Testament tells us, or, or excuse me, we're told in the New Testament that the things in the Old Testament were a shadow of things to come. Uh, Hebrews 10 verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there too perfect. The things written aforetime, the things written in the Old Testament were patterns shadows of what of something better that was coming now if god spent the time to give all the details about the tabernacle and about the things in it don't you think he's going to give some details about the lord's church now not only was the tabernacle detailed and not only was were the things that were in the tabernacle detailed but even the worship that took place in the temple or the tabernacle was detailed. Now, the tabernacle was the forerunner of the temple. Eventually, the tabernacle was replaced with the temple that David wanted to make, but God would not let him make it. But he prepared all the things that were used, and Solomon built a house for God. Uh, Acts 7, verses 45-47 uh, Stephen said, also our fathers that came uh, after brought in with Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, 
who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. So Solomon built a house that was going to be used. Now, God never intended for David or Solomon to build him a house. As a matter of fact, when David tells um, uh, Nathan, when Nathan, uh, when David tells Nathan, you know, I'm, I'm going to build a house uh, for for God. Nathan said, you know, whatever's in your heart, you know, that's what you do. The Lord's with you. But God tells Nathan, you know, you go back and tell David, you go back and tell the king, uh, who told you to build me a house? He said, all this time, I'm paraphrasing Second uh, Samuel 7, but he said, all this time I dwelt in a tent. I walked uh, in a tent and in a tabernacle for, with the children of Israel from Egypt until this day. Why do you think I need a, need a house? Why do you think I need I didn't. I didn't tell you to build a house. I didn't tell anybody to build me a house. So why build... He said, I never said, why build you not me a house of cedar? So God never intended for there to be a temple built. He was always going to be content with the, with the tabernacle. But, but, since David wanted to build a tabernacle, our temple, since David wanted to build a temple, God said, no, you're not going to build it. Solomon will build it. And this is what it's going to be like. And so then God gave the details about the temple. And all the specifics that, that are going to come with the temple. What it's going to be like. Now, so, I mean, if you're going to do something for God, God's going, to, God's going to have some say in what you're going to do or how you're going to do it. So I don't see why people then all of a sudden think, well, God is going to take and he's going to accept whatever I want to give him. When David thought the same thing. David said, I want to give God a house. I want to build God a house. And God said, uh, no, I never asked you to build me a house, but if you're going to build me a house, this is how you're going to do it. So when I'm looking at the New Testament church and I'm looking at how God wants things done, uh, when people say, well, this is what I want to give God. Well, maybe you should consult God and number one, see if he wants it. And if he does want it, then look and see how he wants it done. Because he didn't let David, a man after his own heart, do what he wants without having some input in it. Why do you think he's going to let Joe Schmo do what he wants without having some in, without God having some input in it? So when it came to the tabernacle or the temple worship, God had some input in it. Now listen, the worship that took place in the tabernacle is what uh, is what God was concerned with. Let's go to Second Chronicles five. Second Chronicles chapter five, and I want you to notice uh, what the Bible has to say uh, about the worship that's going to take place in the tabernacle or the temple. Second Chronicles five verse eleven. It came to pass when the priests were come out of their holy places, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph and Heman and Judithan, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. Uh, and it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were, were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Now, some saying, well, James, there's those cymbals and trumpets and instruments of music that you folks in the Church of Christ don't like. Friends, not that I don't like them. It's just God didn't ask for them. He said, well, well, well David used them. Here they are in, in, uh, in the temple, in the tabernacle. And you said, it's a pattern. Well, stay with me here. You're right. They are in the temple. They are in the tabernacle. They're in the worship that was used in the Old Testament. But notice this. Here's the key. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 29. 
and verse 25. Second Chronicles 29, 25. Uh, sorry about that. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with psalteries, with harps, according to the commandment of David, and of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Now this is the key. The reason why those cymbals and psalteries and harps and all the mechanical instruments of music, the reason why they were there for worship in the Old Testament was because it was the commandment of the Lord. Now, think about it, friends. Let's, let's, let's be honest here. Let's be open-minded. Let's be honest with ourselves. Of all the details that we've already gone through about the tabernacle and about the temple, all the details that God put in place, I'm talking about down to the, the bells and the whistles and the knops and the flowers on a candlestick. If God did not want singers and instruments of music in worship in the Old Testament, he would not have allowed that. I mean, he, so, he, he was such a stickler about the details on the little things, he wouldn't let this big thing slide, all right? He, he would, I mean, it would have been very clear this is not acceptable. But, but it was a commandment of the Lord by the prophets. And so the Bible says, And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded to burn uh, to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. And all the congregation worshipped. And the singer sang, and the trumpeter sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Now, all of this is going on in worship in the temple. Why was it allowed? Because God authorized it. God said, this is going to be done. This is going to be part of worship. And so it's apparent that it was sanctioned by God because they were worshiping. I mean, they were worshiping. The horns were blowing. The trumpets were blowing. The singers were singing. The trumpet sounded. <clears throat> and, and here's this burnt offering. And as, as uh, Brother John Shannon used to say now, I hear the music, but I don't smell no beef. If you want to say, well, mechanical instruments and music are okay today, well, why don't you have the offering over there too? You see, the reason why is because God did not authorize mechanical instruments and music in worship today. But he did back then. Now, how do I know that? Well, there's no doubt in my mind that this was authorized to be used in the tabernacle or the sanctuary, or the temple that was built, uh, that was built by Solomon, and, and later rebuilt after they came back from uh, um, uh, from captivity. Because listen to what the psalmist says, Psalm one fifty: Praise ye the Lord, praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him with His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery, with the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath the breath praise the Lord. Now, did you hear that? In his sanctuary. Well, when the psalmist wrote that, what sanctuary was, was around? What sanctuary was, was in existence? It wasn't, it wasn't the church. It was the shadow of the church. It was the tabernacle or the temple. And so, all these mechanical instruments of music were authorized to be used in the old tabernacle, in the old sanctuary. But what about the tabernacle that was to come? What about the sanctuary that would come later? What about the spiritual house? What about the better tabernacle? See, friends, in the New Testament, it's a better system. <clears throat> and now there's a sanctuary 
there's a tabernacle that is so much better than the one that we just got through studying about. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 through 5, Christ is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, friends, listen. Moses pitched the first tabernacle. Moses pitched the first tabernacle. And God said, this is, you know, we're, we're talking about a better tabernacle than that one. We're talking about one that, that Moses uh, didn't pitch, but one that the Lord pitched. That's the better one. Now listen, he says, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is a necessity that this man, talking about Jesus, have some also to offer, somewhat also to offer. So, just like the Old Testament priest had to offer sacrifice, Jesus, as a high priest, needs something to offer. Then it says, verse 4, If he were on earth, he should not be a priest. If Christ were on earth, he couldn't be a priest because he was of the wrong tribe. He was of the tribe of Judah. And all the priests came from the tribe of Levi. So we had to change the law. Hebrews 7, verse 12, so that Christ can be a priest. Now, he has to offer a sacrifice, which he did. He offered himself. He pitched a tabernacle, which is a better tabernacle, a true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now he's a high priest in this better tabernacle, offering a better sacrifice, right? Offering a better sacrifice. He said, seeing there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, well, Christ would have to offer one too, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished when he was about to make the tabernacle. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern, show to thee in the mount. Now, if Moses had to follow a pattern, and Moses had to have all the details just right, about things in a tabernacle, where things were going to be, how they were going to be uh, made and and designed, and their use, their use of, um, and their use, and all the sacrifices that were going to be made, and when they were going to be made, and how they were going to be made, and all the elements and emblem, uh, emblems uh, of the tabernacle were going to be uh, after a certain pattern, and even the uh, uh, the, the worship was detailed about what's going to be done. Do you think that God's not going to put that much detail in the true tabernacle? Do you think he's not going to put that as much detail in the real tabernacle? You know, friends, I've seen people build a house, uh, <clears throat> and I've seen them build a house, just a, a little house to live in until they get their house made, right? So let's say they've got they've got a little piece of land out here and they're going to build them a house that's going to be temporary. Now, that 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 temporary house has still got to provide them with shelter and and uh, you know give them warmth out out of the weather and and uh, out of the heat and you know keep them out of the elements and it's going to have to uh, maybe house their their furnishings or their their goods their possessions until the big house the real house is built. And it's got to take care of their family and so forth. So they they spend some time, you know, making sure that it's going to withstand because they may be in it for a year or two. Do you think that they spend more detail? I mean, if they spend the time uh, and effort to make sure the temporary house is functioning properly, that it's going to protect them, don't you think that they're going to put that much detail and more so into the house that they're going to live in for the rest of their life. So why would God spend all this time talking about the tabernacle, making sure everything's just right, down to the, the rings on the side of the Ark of the Covenant and the sticks that go in the side of it to carry it? Don't you think that he's also going to give some detail about the tabernacle that his son is going to build, that his son's going to die for? Don't you think that that's even more important? And so if he told Moses make things after this pattern, don't you think there's going to be a, a, a even a stricter and more detailed pattern of the, of the true tabernacle? 
See, it's called operating from the lesser to the greater. If the lesser has all these details and all this care is given to make sure everything's right, surely there's going to be even more care and more details given concerning the, the pattern of the tabernacle that Christ is going to pitch, that Christ is going to raise. So if God was specific about what he wanted in the tabernacle that Moses pitched, surely he's going to be specific about what he wants in the true tabernacle that Christ pitched. Now, if instruments of music were used in the tabernacle that Moses pitched because they were specified, wouldn't you expect God then to specifically say what instruments he wants in the true tabernacle in order to worship him? I mean, listen, you don't just put little things, you don't just add something to the worship that God has given all these details about. So the Old Testament had singers and and harp players and saucer players and trumpet blowers and things like that because God specified them. Well, don't come to the new and better tabernacle and think, well, God never specified it, so I think it's going to be all right. <laughs> Who are you kidding? Who are you kidding, friend? See, that's just not the way God operates. And you don't operate that way. If you're going to build your house and you laid out the blueprint and you said, this is what I want in my house, you know, I've got this blueprint, I want a, I want a carport on the west side, and I want, I want carpet in, in down the hall, and I want a good metal roof that's going to last me, you know, 50, 60 years or 100 years on, on, the, on top, and I want it to, uh, I want to have a nice gas stove in the kitchen and, and uh, hardwood floors in the living room, and it's going to have so many bedrooms and so forth. And you specified all these things, and then the builder comes along and says, well, I'm going to put wooden shingles on it instead of the metal roof, and I'm going to put hardwood floors in the hallway instead of the carpet that you wanted. And, and so that gas stove, well, I found a good cheap one, you know, good pot-bellied wood stove that I think will serve the purpose. Man, you, you say, I am not having that. You'd be going, no, I'm having none of that. You, you're going to do what I say, and you're going to do things the way I want it done. Yet God specifies and he gives details about things what he wants in the church that his son paid for with his blood and men come along and say, well, I think I'm going to change some things. I'm going to add some things. I don't really like the way you've got things done, Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to add something to it. And God's going to say, look, if I had wanted that in here, I would have specified, put it in here. Friends, don't think, don't think that it is a small thing to change the pattern of of the New Testament church. And don't think it's a small thing to change the pattern of what is authorized to go in the New Testament church and how worship, <clears throat> excuse me, how worship in the New Testament church is to be conducted. God clearly specified <coughs> excuse me, what he wanted in New Testament worship. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. <coughs> now, there's an instrument that God says can be used. And that's the heart. That's, that's the one we specified. And friends, the reason why God specified that is because that's one everybody can use. Everybody can't play a psaltery, a harp, or a piano, or a banjo, or a guitar. Everybody can't play that. But everybody can make melody in their heart. Everybody. Everybody can. And that's why God specified that. So everybody could participate. And plus, it's a spiritual tabernacle. It's not a physical tabernacle. He, the, the things that he allowed in the Old Testament, those were shadows of things. The real thing is a better thing. It's a better temp, a tabernacle. So you've got to follow the pattern. Now, someone might say, well, uh, 
James, you know, maybe they, maybe in the New Testament, they didn't have mechanical instruments of music. Well, if David had them, if they had them under the Old Testament for the tabernacle, somebody knows how to make them. I guarantee they just didn't drop off the face of the earth and not know how to make trumpets and things like that. I mean, they didn't forget how to make those things in uh, just a few hundred years. In the 400 years between the Old and New Testament, they didn't forget how to make psalteries and harps and and uh, stringed instruments and organs and things like that. As a matter of fact, they knew how to make those things way back in the Old Testament. Uh, in Genesis in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 21, listen to what, what the Bible says. It says, uh, And Ada bare Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and as such as have cattle, and his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. So, so even before the flood, they knew how to make a harp. They knew how to make a mechanical instrument of music. So if God had wanted them to have them in a New Testament church, I guarantee you they could have been made. Not to mention the fact he could have given them the wisdom on how to make them. He could, have, he could have made very special instruments that no one had ever thought of before and given men wisdom on how to make them. That's what he did when he was making a tabernacle. That's exactly what he did when he was making a tabernacle. In, in uh, Exodus 31, Exodus 31, God tells uh, Moses, he said, I have called by name Bezaliel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted have I put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. The tabernacle of the congregation, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is their own, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table and his furniture, and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture, and the laver and his foot, and the clothes of service, and the holy garments of Aaron the priest, and the garments of his son, to minister in the, in the priest's office. All of these things God gave special wisdom so they'd know how to make them. If God had wanted mechanical instrument to music in worship, he could have said, you know what? I don't want the guitar, the banjo, the, the, the piano, or anything like that. I'm going to give some special wisdom so that somebody can create an instrument that no one has ever heard of. And that's what we're going to use in the New Testament worship. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Instead of what he said, he said, I'm going to, Christ said, I'm going to, the spirit of truth is going to guide you into all truth. And he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And he didn't show them a single thing about some newfangled uh, instrument of music. And he didn't say a single thing about an old fangled instrument of music. What he did was, was tell them what they needed to know about New Testament worship. And that was to sing. Mechanical instruments and music were not part of all the truth that was revealed by the Holy Spirit. Not a single word was revealed by the apostles from our Lord about using mechanical instruments and music in worship to the Lord. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 26, verse 30, the Bible says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They, they just sung. They didn't play. The apostles never commanded someone to play a stringed instrument or an organ or a harp or things like that. It just wasn't mentioned. It wasn't that they weren't around. It wasn't that they didn't know how to make them. And it wasn't that, you know, they couldn't afford them, whatever. It's just, this is what God said, use. Sing and make melody in the heart to the Lord. 
Hebrews 2 verse 12, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Hebrews 13, 15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. God never commanded it. He never even thought about it. It's not that he couldn't have. He could have thought of something that we would never even thought of. But he designed, he designed the true tabernacle, the tabernacle that his son pitched, he designed it and what was going to go in it <clears throat> and what kind of worship was going to be in it. And he designed it without mechanical instruments of music. Now, who, who thinks that they are greater than God to say, well, I think I'm going to put that in there. You know, uh, <laughs> Maybe this is not too crude. It's, I mean, it's whatever, but uh, my wife likes to watch these shows about look, people looking for houses. And one time I was watching when I went there and these people were looking at this house. And in the bathroom of this house was a urinal. Now, you see those things in restaurants and stores, stuff like that, but who puts them in their house? But somebody said, this is what I want in my house. Now, friends, if that's what you want in your house, you can put it in there. But if I'm building a house, you're not going to get to come up and say, well, this is what I'm going to put in the bathroom. Oh, no, you're not. You know? You don't get to dictate what goes in someone else's house. Why do you think then you can dictate what goes in the Christ house? Why do you get to say, well, this is what I'm going to put in your house and this is how I'm going to worship you? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you're going to get to say, well, this is what I think is good? God could have very well specified it if he wanted it, but he didn't want it. He didn't want it. Or he would have said he wanted it. Now, I know we get that, friends. I know we understand that principle. And again, if God spent so much time and effort talking about the details of the Old Testament tabernacle and what was going to go in it, surely he gave some forethought into what was going to be in the true tabernacle. And he did not think for one minute, one second, one blink of an eye, well, let's put some mechanical instruments of music in there. No, he didn't think anything about that. As a matter of fact, all of the early uh, church historians, the so-called church fathers, when they're writing about New Testament worship, they all, they all talk about worshiping on the first day of the week. They talk about singing. They never talk about mechanical instruments of music. That doesn't come along until almost 700 years after the Lord's Church was established. Pope uh, Vitalian is said to have first introduced the organs into some of the, the Catholic churches in Western Europe about 1670. So man comes along and says, I think that sounds good. Well, you may think it sounds good, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't give you the authority to add it to the Lord's Church. That doesn't mean that it's, that you get to add it to the blueprint. Because here's the thing. Remember, we're following a pattern here. And if you add something to the blueprint, you add something to the pattern, you change the pattern. You change the, what you're building. So that's an addition to God's blueprint. And adding things that are not authorized makes it a different house. If I hired you to build my house, and I had the floor plan laid out, and I had the blueprints, and everything was just so. And it was a single level home. And I come to this house when, when you're done building it. You say, James, I'm done building it. Come look at your new house. And that new house has two stories on it. That's not my house. I didn't tell you to put two stories on it. You know, if, if I come to that house and things are changed that are different from the blueprint, that's not my house. 
That's your house. You made it your own. You, you designed it the way you wanted it. Well, what does that make what does that make a church that men add to? What does that make the Lord's church when men come along and say, well, I'm going to add what I want to? It makes it a different house. In Matthew 21, verses 12 through 13, Jesus went into the temple of God. Now listen, he went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. They turned it from one thing to another. It wasn't the Lord's house anymore. And when you add to the pattern that you find in the Bible, friends, you're making it your church, not the Lord's church. When you say, well, this is what I want in my worship, well... You can have it in your work in your church. That if you're going to start a church and you want to you want to build it and you want to pay for it, you want to die for it, then you can do that in your church. But not in the Lord's church. You don't get to have liberty to change the pattern. You don't get to make modifications to the blueprint. Not the Lord's church. Now. If you go to the Bible, you can find the blueprint of the New Testament church. You can find what it looks like. You can find out how it's organized. We've talked about some of that in the past couple of weeks. You'll find the blueprint. And not only will you find out what it looks like, what it's organized like, you'll find out what goes on in the inside. You'll find out how we worship. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, truth, friends, is God's word. John 17, 17. Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. You cannot worship in spirit and in truth by doing something that's contrary to truth. How is that even possible? So, look at the Bible. Look at the Bible. Look at the blueprint. Find out what belongs in the Lord's church, in worship. How does God want us to worship? He wants us to use the fruit of our lips. He wants us to offer up the the instrument of the praise out of the instrument of our heart, singing and making melody. He wants us to edify one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. Sing with grace in your heart to the Lord. He, he wants us to use the things that everybody has. He didn't he didn't have he didn't have any special requirements. He says, I'm going to design the church in such a way that everybody can worship me the way I want to be worshipped. And friends, that's what it comes down to. When people change, it's because they want to do things their way. No, friends, it's not, it's not your church, and you don't get to change the blueprint. Now, friends, you can find the church in the Bible. You can find the Lord's church. It's the church of Christ. It's the church of Christ. It's the one that he died for. In Acts, Acts 20, uh, 28, the Bible says that Christ shed his blood. He, he, he purchased it with his own blood. And when you buy something, friends, you get to have it your way. And Christ bought the church, and men come along and say, yeah, but this is how you want it. No. You don't get to tell Christ how he wants things done in his church. What you get to do is you get to follow the blueprint and you get to build it uh, away according to the pattern. You don't get to change things. You don't get to change things. So we're looking at the Bible as God's blueprint. And you can find the New Testament church. It's the church of Christ. It's the church of Christ. It's the only church you can find in the Bible, friends. A thousand dollar reward if you can find any other kind of church in the Bible that's named and has organization uh, in the Bible, denomination. You can't find them. The only one you're really going to find is the Lord's church. Friends, I'm out of time. I want you to know I appreciate your time, your attention. I hope you'll tune in again next week. Again, my phone number is 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at gmail.com.
Thanks for listening, and always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. God bless. Have a good day.